Good evening, brothers and sisters, and welcome to another segment of End Times Like These. We are so thankful and grateful that you have joined us here on the Apocalypse Channel this wonderful Sabbath afternoon. It has been a while since we uh, did uh, programs live uh, because of things that have been happening here uh, at the ministry, but we are thankful to be back in the studio with you today and for you being patient with us as we were getting things taken care of. We want to welcome everyone here. I hope that you have your pen, your pad, your Bible as we delve into uh, what we're going to talk about today. I want to go ahead and say that um, coming very soon, probably in the next segment or two, we will begin to go through the book uh, the King of the North, the King of the South. And as we go through this book, we want you to join us here uh, as we go through this uh, on each segment of End Times Like These. Now, we will not be trying to explain the whole book because we want you to get the book and to read and to study, but we will do uh, segments on this book as we walk through it to help us to understand what we are reading. I know sometimes people are not uh, keen on history. And so it will be a good way to try to walk through that history and to study that history and to uh, get a better understanding of the King of the North. It is a very vital subject, I believe, and understanding of it has uh, a, 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 an implication on our spiritual understanding of God's word and who is who and what they mean and what they are doing. So that is coming. Uh, today, we will be talking about afflicting the soul. Yes, afflicting the soul. And so this is going to be, I believe, a good segment. Uh, we'll be with you just for a little while today, but we're very glad that you're here. If you know someone who needs to, or, you, or they need to, or you think that they would gain a good spiritual blessing from uh, joining us, send them a text message or an email and encourage them to join uh, the program. Uh, but after today's program, it will be available also on YouTube as well. Um, and so I want to encourage you to, if you don't catch it live, to go and catch the broadcast after it is put on YouTube. Well, before we get started, uh, let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we are so very thankful that you have chosen to be with us. Lord, we are thankful for your presence for your Sabbath. And Lord, as we get ready to go through this information and to touch on a few things, Lord, we ask for the aid of the Holy Spirit because Lord, we can understand nothing without you. Be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, brothers and sisters, we, we won't uh, do a whole lot of, a um, whole lot more uh, introduction. I will say this for those who are watching, uh, announcements are going to be going out very, very, very soon. But the word has kind of trickled out already a little bit. The Upper Room Camp Meeting will be taking place August 3 through 8 at the Springville Camp and Conference Center where it, is, where it has been held for the last few years. We will be back at the same place during the same dates. Uh, registration is officially open. I believe that uh, there was an issue on registration that is being worked through, but Registration is officially open. Camp meeting will take place. I've been getting many requests, phone calls, text messages, emails about the upper room camp meeting, and we will be doing it this year. So there you have it. It is going to take place. Uh, the upper room camp meeting 16 will take place at the Springville Camp and Conference Center um, that um, will be taking place. So we wanted everyone to know that and to. Um, to be able to plan for that. Uh, we are at the last minute, we recognize that, but due to the pandemic and, and the regulations and things that were going on, we just wasn't sure how or if it could take place, but indeed it is going to take place. We will endeavor in years to come, as, as the Lord says so, to definitely plan ahead and to get the word out much earlier. And so we do apologize for that but we are going to do it this year. And we want to make sure that you had that information as well. All right. Today's subject topic is afflicting the soul, afflicting the soul. I hope you recognize that 
we must afflict our souls, just as Israel had to afflict their souls on the Day of Atonement. It is a must that we do. If we do not afflict our souls, the same things that would have happened to an Israelite that did not afflict his soul will happen to us. We will not be prepared. Uh, our lives will not be right with the Lord. Our characters will not be transformed. We will not be ready to see him in peace. It is, it is just that simple. We must be afflicting our soul. And we must be afflicting our soul right now. Uh, I cannot make it more plain that the, the time to afflict our souls, the time of preparation is right now. If we squander the opportunity to prepare and afflict our souls, if we squander that opportunity, we will not be saved. It is as simple as that. And brothers and sisters, I believe that all of us want to be saved in God's kingdom. We want to see Jesus in peace when he comes back. So as we delve into that this evening, I hope you have your Bibles. I hope you have your King James Bible. Turn in God's word to Ephesians chapter six, Ephesians chapter six. And we're going to read. This is as our, 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 our opening scripture reading. We will go through this a little bit and then we will kind of segue and move on into afflicting uh, the soul or afflicting your soul, my soul. Ephesians chapter six, starting at verse 10. That's Ephesians chapter six. Six, starting at verse 10. And we'll read down to verse 17. All right. God's word says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, not part of it, but the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, God's word says, stand. It says, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand, withstanding the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, the Bible says, take the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. All right, brothers and sisters, there you have it. God's word says, put on the whole armor of God, not a part of it, not a piece of it, but the whole armor of God. Why does God, why does the Lord does not uh, have words in the Bible just to have them there? He puts things there for a reason. So he tells us, listen, put on the, <coughs> the whole armor of God that you may be able to do something. And that is stand against the wiles of the devil. Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So because we do all of these things, because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers and, 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 and all of these things, we need to put on the whole armor of God. And so the Bible says, listen, if you want to withstand the wiles of the devil, if you want to stand against him, if you want to be saved, if you want to have a character that looks like Christ, if you want to come out on the other side, a victor, a winner, a saved person, then you need to put on, I need to put on the whole armor of God. Then it goes on to say, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Having done all to stand, stand therefore, this is how you do it. Have your loins girt, with truth, 
and having on the breastplate of righteousness and on your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take the shield of faith. The Bible says it is impossible without faith. It is impossible to please the Lord. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet, protect that mind. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And so the Bible is the sword. The faith is our shield. The helmet is our salvation. And so uh, the breastplate covers us and our loins gird about. In other words, covered up with the tools that God has given us to withstand the wiles of the devil. Why is this important? Because if we do not withstand the wiles of the devil, if we do not become victorious over sin, if we do not have a character that is transformed, then we will simply not be saved. And you know, there's a lot of conversation around victory over sin. And do we have to have it? And is it necessary? Is it even possible? And brothers and sisters, to, to think that victory over sin is not possible, is not necessary, is just a sad commentary that Satan has, um, um, has, 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 has fooled people, has to deceive people into a false security. Because if you don't believe that we have to have victory, then it's really okay to go on through life and do what you want. Um, there's gray areas. We can kind of pick and choose. It's either God, Satan, or something else. No, it's, it's, it's God or Satan. It's one or the other. It's black or white when it comes to this. To do, uh, to do wrong is sin. To go against God's word is sin. To go against the Ten Commandments is sin. To go against God's law fa family is just sin. And so we must put on the whole armor of God. And, and without that, today what we're going to be talking, without that, we won't make it. And today we want to talk about afflicting the soul, because this is how Israel stood in the day of atonement. We are living in a type of the day of atonement. And so as we are doing that, brothers and sisters, I want to go to the screen and show you something. I just want us to have a visual as we get ready to get started going forward about afflicting our soul. So let's look at the screen. We have a picture here of the the um, the sanctuary, and on the plan on, on this on this uh, on this slide of the sanctuary, it's called the plan of redemption, the plan of salvation. It says one year of the sanctuary services represents the whole plan of salvation. We have at the top. You see the Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, trumpets, atonement, and the tabernacles. And all of those had significant meaning for Israel uh, as they went through them throughout the year. And it goes from when they got out of bondage, out of Egypt, all the way to Canaan land, all the way to the heavenly Canaan. And so we know based on prophecy, we know based on an understanding of Daniel and Revelation that we are living in a type of the Day of Atonement, the 10th day of the seventh month, the most solemn of all of the services for the Israelites was the day of atonement. And so for that, they had to prepare. They had to do some things to prepare for that day because to slip up, to mess up on the day of atonement had real serious implications. And so let's go to God's word. So for some, this may be review. For others, this may be new, but we wanna go there and read this scripture and analyze it and go through it. Let's go over to Leviticus chapter 23, Leviticus chapter 23, and we'll go over there to that, Leviticus 23, and we will pick up at verse 27. We will pick up in verse 27, Leviticus 23, um, and let's pick up actually in verse 27. Seven. It says, and on the, it says also, I'm sorry, on the 10th day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you. And ye shall do what? Afflict your souls and offer 
an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Let's go to verse 28. And it says, and ye shall do no work in that same day. Why? Because it is a day of atonement or a day of at one mint to make at one mint for you before the Lord, your God. Verse 29. For whatsoever soul it shall be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. And verse 30 says, and what's well, that is verse 30. I'm sorry. Verse 31 says, ye shall do no manner of work. Ye shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statue forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. All right, let's go back to verse 27. Verse 27 says, also on the 10th day of the seventh month, it shall be a day of atonement. It shall be uh, one holy convocation unto you. Two, and ye shall afflict your souls. Three, offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And four, do no work. So now, brothers, says we have these four phases, these four things that had to be happening on the Day of Atonement. So the Bible makes clear that he's talking about the Day of Atonement. And on the Day of Atonement, they had to have a preparation. And on that day, it says that this day should be a holy convocation. What is a holy convocation? A meeting. Something set, a meeting set aside for a particular spiritual uh, outcome, a situation. And so he said, listen, all of these were the same way. All of, when you read in God's word about the Passover and the unleavened bread and first fruits, the Bible repeatedly calls them a holy convocation because they were set apart for something special. They were to help achieve something. They represented something. And so it is today, the Bible calls the Sabbath also what? A holy convocation. Convocation. Why? Because it is set apart. It is set aside for a special purpose. It is a special day. It is a holy day. And God gave it to us for a particular reason. It is a seal between him and us. And so this is why the devil is fighting against the Sabbath, because he doesn't want God's seal to be upon us and to be in our foreheads. And so he causes us to make light of the Sabbath. It, it turns into something besides a holy convocation. And so the Day of Atonement was supposed to be a holy convocation, as well as all the other days the, 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 and the sanctuary services. It was a holy convocation. The Bible also says the Sabbath is a holy convocation. I was reading through the Spirit of Prophecy and ran upon quotes that also said our camp meetings are supposed to be a holy convocation. It's supposed to be something set aside for a special spiritual purpose. Now, I don't know about you, but if, if I'm going to draw an object lesson from this, if I'm looking at the, the days of the, the sanctuary services, uh, you know, uh, all seven of them, and the Bible refers to them as a holy convocation, if it also says the Sabbath is a holy convocation, and then the prophet follows up with our camp meetings are supposed to be a holy convocation, what I am deducing from that, what I'm understanding God to be saying to me is, listen, the Sabbath is that important and it should be a day where you fellowship with me, that you spend more time in the word that day. You spend more time with me. You set aside the world, your job, your issues, your woes, and you spend that time with me. And I want to come close to you during that time. And I want to begin to speak to you and to show you and influence you more and to show you more of myself and in your word with no distractions. It's supposed to help you be prepared for what is coming. Also, the prophet brings out that to be prepared for the Sabbath is a type of being prepared for heaven. So on earth it is a holy convocation. It has been set aside for a spiritual purpose. And God has said, listen, each seven days, my holy Sabbath comes prepare for it. Get ready for it. And this is how you get ready. I want to show you how to get ready to see me in peace. And so brothers and sisters, 
just like the Sabbath is a holy convocation. It is set aside for a holy purpose. We are reminded by God to what? Keep it holy. Think about our camp meetings. They are to be set aside for a specific spiritual purpose. Yes, we're to go to our camp meetings, but the, the goal of our camp meetings is to get in the upper room, so to speak. And to understand what God is trying to tell and to show and to help us both spiritually and practically get more information and understanding of God's word of how to be prepared to see him in peace. This is what our camp meetings are supposed to be all about. A holy convocation. Now, brothers and sisters, with that, the Day of Atonement is supposed to be a holy convocation. We're kind of. I've kind of reviewed that and went over that. It's a, the day set aside for a specific spiritual purpose. Next, it says to afflict your souls. Afflict my soul. So what does that look like in the Bible when it says that every Israelite was supposed to afflict his soul? What was he supposed to be doing? How did that come about? How did they go about afflicting their souls? Many times as I travel about and speak to people and talk to people and study with people, this is the question that comes about. Brother Mason, I, I, I understand that we got to get victory. Like that's kind of plain in God's word. But how do you do it? And brothers and sisters, I, 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 I always you know, kind of lean back or step back. And that's a loaded question. How do we get victory over sin? What is the practicalness of how to achieve that. And there are many thoughts and schools of thoughts around how to do that. And there's many things in the Bible and I believe they're all cohesive. There is a way that God has given us to get victory. And that is to afflict our souls. Let's turn over in our Bibles to Ezra. Ezra chapter eight. Ezra chapter eight. Yes, Ezra chapter 8. And we'll start at verse 21. Actually, we'll just read verse 21. Ezra chapter 8, verse 21. God's word says this. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava, that we might afflict ourselves before our God to seek of him a right way for us and for our little ones and for all our substance. So what is the word of God saying? That Ezra was here talking and he proclaimed a fast there. So they were going to fast. I think we understand what fasting means at the river of Ahava, that they may do something, that they may afflict ourselves or themselves before God to seek of him a right way. So to understand the right way, what to do uh, in, a, in certain situations for them, their little ones, their children, and for all of their substance, they were to seek God's face. And to do that, they fasted so that they could afflict their selves. So in order to be able to afflict ourselves, the first thing we must do is visit the subject of diet. Now they fasted. So the question is, if they fasted, that means they did without food. If they fasted, the question today is if we're living in uh, a time where we are to be afflicting our souls in a type of the day of atonement, if we are to afflict our souls and it must first start with a fast, can we fast every day of our lives? Oh, of course, the answer is a resounding no, we cannot fast for, our, for the rest of our life. So what we must do, brothers and sisters, is have a diet that is a type of fast. What am I saying? When we fast, what happens? Our head clears up. Our mind becomes keen. We begin to hear the voice of God in ways we have never been able to hear it before. So we go on a fast. The first day is a struggle. Second day is, is not as bad as a struggle, but you're kind of weak. 
By day three, the body is beginning to realize, okay, we must be fasting for real. We're not going to get any food and other processes beginning to begin to kick in and you begin to have mental clarity. That's why we fast. We want to hear from the Lord. We want, we need an answer to a situation. We began to not just pray, but what? Fast and pray. And so it is Ezra instituted a fast so that they could afflict their souls. So if we want to afflict our souls, the first step in doing so is to institute a fast, to institute a diet that is commensurate of a fast. In other words, eat in a way that will still allow us to have clear minds and clear perceptions and our understanding can be at its best. So how do we do that? Yes, that means we must back away from all of the cooking. The prophet tells us that there is too much cooking. She says that it is, it has filled the world with chronic invalids. And so we need to add more raw food into our diets and lessen the amount of cooked food. And then the way we cook food, we need to prepare it in a healthy way. What we want to do is to eat for strength and not for drunkenness. So to afflict our souls, we know that we must visit first the idea around diet. We must have a diet that is resembling of a fast. In other words, the way you eat still gives you the same outcome of a fast. And even then we would still fast from food at different times for different specific purposes, but even our diets should be commensurate with a fast. In other words, we would eat for strength and not drunkenness. We would not eat and then our minds just become so cloudy that we can't think straight. We can't study the word of God and we keep doing that. We keep putting things in our bodies and our temples that are affecting our minds. It's affecting our bodies and disease is growing within us because of our diets. Seventh day Adventist should be the most healthy people on the planet, but, but by far and large, a lot of God's people in the remnant church are sick. And a lot of us are sick because we have broken the health laws and done things that God has told us not to do. We're not getting enough rest. We're not drinking enough water. We're eating too much cooked food. We're eating it late at night. We're not getting any green food. We're, we're, we're eating too much carbs and we're doing all of these things that God has said, listen, get your diet in order. I'm not telling you, you can't enjoy food, but prepare it healthy. Eat temperately, not too much and don't be eating late, get rest. These things help the mind be clear. So we want the Holy Spirit to have control of this right here. So before you can even visit the thought of afflicting, taking away, we're going to read a quote that, that makes that clear. Before we can begin to afflict our souls, Ezra instituted a fast. So that tells us that we can't fast for our whole life, but our diet needs to be a type of fast. Now, listen, brothers, so this is important. If we don't do it, we risk not afflicting our souls. We risk not being ready to see Jesus in peace. All right. So now a holy convocation. Then it says to afflict their souls. We just read in Ezra about he instituted a fast first. We, we get the inference here. We understand that our diet should be like a fast. And so now before uh, you can actually afflict your souls. Let's look at the definition of afflict based on a quote in the spirit of prophecy. And there's other quotes out there, but I, I put this one in here. It says Satan works through the elements to garner his harvest of unprepared souls. He has studied the secrets of the laboratories of nature and he uses all his power to control the elements as far as God allows. When he was suffered to do what? Afflict Job, how quickly flocks and herds, servants, houses, children were swept away, one trouble succeeding another. And so brothers and sisters, we see 
uh, say another as in a moment. We know what happened to Job. When you go to Job chapter one, two, and three, and you start going through what happened to Job, we know in one day he lost everything, houses, children, uh, animals, all swept away in one day. So when Satan was allowed to afflict Job, what did he do? He took things from him that caused him to be in a state of pain, a state of uh, needing to seek God because he was in such dire pain. So it is today when we talk about afflicting our souls, when Israel had to afflict their souls, what did they have to do? Take things away out of their life and not participate, put it away. And that was commensurate with showing us that those who would be living in a type of the day of atonement would have to do the same thing. We could not go to heaven with wearing the garments of this world. We would have to take off this world. We would have to take away things, get rid of things, disconnect from things, stop participating in things and only have our characters on us, girt about us. With our characters being covered and changed and transformed by Christ, then we can be prepared to see him in, in peace. Then we would have afflicted ourselves. We would have gotten rid of this world out of our, out of our lives. Self would die. Self would not still be the one in charge. God would have control of our minds and he would be leading us and guiding us on this pathway. So the devil was allowed to afflict Job and in afflicting Job, he took things away from Job. So when we are afflicting ourselves today, the idea is to take things out of our lives, to have things removed from us that are not like Christ. And just like the Israelites, we must be afflicting our souls right now, not next year, not two years from now. Brothers and sisters, I can't give you a day and an hour, but based on prophecy, Jesus is getting ready to, to come. This thing is wrapped up. It is finished. We are looking at the end of all things. There is no guessing about that. And so here we are. We got to afflict our souls. Our diets must be a type of a fast. So now we understand that afflicting the soul means to remove things from the soul. Not, not, to, not to bow down under a bull rush or to beat our chest until it hurts or to do some other type of penance. No, it is to remove things from our lives with God's help because we cannot remove anything. We cannot stop sinning on our own accord. We cannot remove sin out of our life without God's help. And so to afflict means to take away, means to put in pain, to put, to put in chains. What are we trying to put in chains? Self. What are we trying to hold down? Self. Why? Because we want God to live in us. We want Christ to be living in us fully. Fully. So brothers and sisters, we know what afflict means. Now, let's go in our Bibles and look at one other text before we go forward. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58. And we're going to start with verse 4. Isaiah chapter 58, starting at verse 4. God's word says, Behold, ye fast for strife and debate, and to smite with the fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as ye do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. Oh, really? Let's see what they were doing. Let's go down to verse five. Is it such a fast that I have chosen a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast? and an acceptable day to the Lord. So we see right here before we go further that their whole concept of a fast, their whole concept of preparing uh, for something was all wrong. So the, the Lord said, listen, you got it all wrong. Ye fast for strife and debate. In other words, you, you will want to fast. You will want to do without something to win a debate or when it comes to strife. But 
You don't want to fast to become like me. You don't want to fast to become Christ-like. Your, your idea of becoming Christ-like is all wrong. Uh, I'm not calling it a fast for you to go put your head under a bull rush or to do some type of penance. Let me explain to you what I mean by afflict your souls. What I mean by a fast. All right, let's go back to God's word. So we have verse six, Isaiah chapter 58, verse six. It says, is not this the fast that I have chosen to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens and to let the oppressed go free and that ye break every yoke? Verse seven, is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? When thou seest the naked that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. In other words, he says, listen, in verse 6, is not this a fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burden. So on top of a, a, a physical fast from food, the Lord is also uh, saying that the fast that I've told you to is to come aside and do something different. Help those who, who are bound by sin and bound by the devil. Help those who are less than. Uh, reach out and help those who are widowed and need our help. Because one of the things that Israel has stopped doing, violence was running rampant in Israel. And now they were not doing those things. They were not seeing after the elderly and helping those who needed help. It was every man for himself, much like it is today. There was no love or Christ-like character being exemplified in Israel. And because of that, the Lord finally said, there is no, uh, um, there is no solution. There is, there's nothing else I could do. There's no remedy, the Bible says. And so he put them in Babylonian captivity to get their attention. And brothers and sisters, we know that, that even, though, even though that was a sad commentary, what is even more sad is that a million or more went into captivity, but only 42,000 came back. Only a small group were ready to do what it took to finish the work of building the walls in Jerusalem. So it is today. We are told, unfortunately, every seventh day Adventists will not be saved. Only a small group within this church are going to be willing to do all that God has asked us to do. And let me be clear. It is no time now, even with all of the apostasy in the church, to run off and leave. Brothers and sisters, there are still souls that need to hear this truth for this hour so that they can make an informed choice to follow Christ. If we run away and go somewhere else and start our own things somewhere else and become independent and all of that sort of thing, brothers and sisters, we are turning our backs on those who need our help the most. Judgment is coming. Probation is getting ready to close on God's people. There are people who are still perishing inside the church. Run away, start our own thing? No, that is not in God's word. And I don't care how you look at the spirit of prophecy. I don't care how you misconstrue it, put it in order and do all of these things. At the end of it all, to leave God's church is not what God has told us to do. But he did tell us, my church would be feeble and defective. He did say apostasy was coming. He did say that we will repeat the, 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 what happened to the Jews. Brothers and sisters, it cannot be more plain. Is there going to be apostasy in the church? Yes. Is there going on? Yes. It will not stop. It will continue until they go too far and turn their backs on the temple and face the east as they did in Ezekiel. It will go until that happens. God has already said it. So it's not a surprise. Is it a challenge? Yes. Is it problematic? Yes. Does it cause us to make choices and to do things uh, along the way to help our spirituality stay strong? Yes. But leave? No. Does this mean stay in a particular church? that is hanging off the rafters and the worship is ungodly? No, go somewhere else. But to leave, still not the answer. Brothers and sisters, moving on. 
So Israel had to afflict their souls. The Jews had to do the same thing when it came to the day of atonement. Here we are reading in Isaiah about this fast, about the kind of fast that God has called us to, has ca had called them to. Really, what we find out is that they didn't understand. They, the, the water had gotten so money that they did not understand what it was that they needed to do to become like Christ. Much of it is today. Much of, many of God's people don't understand or recognize what it's going to take to be like Christ. Many people are trying of their own will, their own power to try to do what needs to be done. And they keep failing and then they finally say it cannot be done. But it can be done. We must be leaning on Christ. We must be, we must be exhibiting faith. Our faith must grow. You, don't you know and realize that God is seeking to grow our faith? Through tests and trials, he's seeking to do this. We're either going into a problem, coming out of a problem, or getting ready to go into another problem. Brothers and sisters, it's the tests and trials that keep us focused. We forget about this world. We can still work and go to school and pay bills and shop for clothes and do all of these things, and yet our minds can still be turned heavenly, heavenward while we're in a trial. But a lot of times when things get good, and things aren't bad anymore. Then we begin to forget. We begin to get caught up. So the Lord says, I want to keep their attention and I want to grow their faith. So I must put them through a test and a trial. And so their lives will ebb and flow through tests and trials to keep them focused on what is real. This world has nothing to offer them. Satan does not have anything worthy to offer you except for death, period. That's it. And if given the opportunity, he would just snuff your life out. God in his mercy has given us the opportunity to continue to choose him day by day. So we understand that they didn't understand the kind of fast that God had for them. Many of us do not understand the type of fast and what it means to afflict our souls. Thus, we are talking about it today. And I'm hoping and praying that when this is over, you would understand even more so what it means to afflict your souls. For me to afflict my soul, so that we will be prepared to see Jesus in peace. I want to go to the screen and read something to you here. Uh, I'm going to go to, this is going to, this is really going to be great controversy, page 489, 489. It says, we are now living in the great day of atonement in the typical service while the high priest was making the atonement for Israel, all were required to do what? Afflict their souls by repentance of sin. There is that, there is that turning away. To afflict their souls by what? Repentance of sin and humiliation before the Lord, lest they be cut off from among the people in like manner. All who would have their names retained in the book of life should now, in the few remaining days of their probation, afflict their souls before God by sorrow for sin and true repentance. So we see right here that to afflict the soul, we do that by repentance of sin and humiliation. And down at the bottom, it says, uh, to afflict their souls before God by sorrow for sin and true repentance. What does it mean by true repentance? That means to truly turn away from, to truly turn away from sin, to confess it to the Lord and to repent. A true repentance means to confess it and to turn away from it. So the brothers and sisters, we see that we already know that the official definition of afflict is to take away. So now we see right here that to take away sin, we need to, to repent of it, have a true repentance. It tells us we're living in the last great day of atonement. It goes on to tell us about the typical service. And then it goes on to tell us what, what must be happening here in the end. Let's continue reading. It says, there must be faith, deep 
faithful searching of heart, the light, frivolous spirit indulged by so many professed Christians must be put away. There is earnest warfare before all who would subdue the evil tendencies that strive for the mastery. The work of preparation is in what? An individual work. We are not saved in groups. Salvation is an individual work. Uh, salvation is an individual thing, but the work of preparing is an also an individual work. What I do for me does not do anything for you. You must afflict your souls and I must afflict my soul. Whatever we are dealing with in our lives, we must put it away with Christ's help. So what you're dealing with and what I'm dealing with may be two separate things, but we both must do the same thing in afflicting our souls to put it away. We have hereditary and cultivated tendencies towards sin. Things that happen so automatic, we don't even have to think about it. Even those things, God's saying, listen, give that to me. I can take it and put it to the side and you won't have to be dealing with that if you continue to give it to me day after day. Let's continue on. Well, I'm going to go to, I'm going to go to the book here. Great controversy because I don't have the slide for this, but this is the great controversy page 619. And I think this is like the third paragraph down the page. It says they afflict their souls talking about Israel before God pointing to their past repentance. Talk, well, this is actually talking about in the time of trouble, what we are going to be doing says they afflict their souls before God, pointing to their past repentance of their many sins and pleading the Savior's promise. Let him take hold of my strength that he may make peace with me and he shall make peace with me. Isaiah 27, five, their faith does not fail because their prayers are not immediately answered. Though suffering the keenest anxiety, terror, and distress, they do not cease their intercessions. They, lo they lay hold of the strength of God as Jacob laid hold of the angel. And the language of their souls is, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. Had not Jacob previously repented of his sin in obtaining the birthright by fraud, God would not have heard his prayer and mercifully preserved his life. So in the time of trouble, if the people of God had unconfessed sins to appear before them while tortured with fear and anguish, they would be overwhelmed. Despair would cut off their faith and they could not have confidence to plead with God for deliverance. But while they have a deep sense of their unworthiness, they have no concealed wrongs to reveal. Their sins have gone beforehand to judgment and have been blotted out, and they cannot bring them to repentance. I mean, to remembrance. So brothers and sisters, even in the time of trouble, we will continually be afflicting our souls and putting before the Lord our, our sins and saying, Lord, I've repented of that. I, I'm just... Lord, I just want to continue to pray that you, you would continue to cleanse me. And Lord, remember my sins that I have given to you and I have turned from them. Lord, because Satan will be trying to torture us with the idea that we're not going to be saved. It will be torture and it will be fear. But the fear is not of death. The fear is, Lord, do I have any sins that I have not given to you, that I've not repented of? This is why the Lord says right now. Be afflicting your soul now, putting your sins on the curtain, getting, confessing and repenting and, and giving me your sins that I died for so that I can put my bloodstained robe on you so that you may be clean. And so even in the time of trouble, we will still be afflicting our souls in, in prayer and repentance and begging and pleading with God to make sure that we have not forgotten any sin to put on the curtain, that we would be cleansed, that we would be prepared to see him in peace. And brothers and sisters, listen, we must afflict our souls and we must be afflicting our souls now to wait to the National Sunday Law, to, to, to 
in theory, because you really couldn't do this, but to wait till the time of trouble and then just then be beginning to afflict your souls would be way too late. I just was out of town <clears throat> not too long ago, and I told a group of people the same preparation it takes to be ready for the Sunday law. It's the same preparation it takes to be sealed, the same preparation it takes to receive the latter rain, uh, and the same preparation to give the loud cry. In essence, the preparation you do now is the preparation to be saved. Brothers and sisters, we cannot afford to squander the opportunity that we have right now to prepare to afflict our souls so that we may see Jesus in peace. All right, let's go back to the screen as we get ready to come to a close. It says, men of courage are wanted now. Men who will venture something for the truth's sake. Men who will be sober, but not gloomy and desponding. Men who will watch unto prayer and whose prayers will be mingled with living, what? Active faith. We may be, what? Cheerful and even joyful. Even under temptation, our language may be that of faith and hope and courage. But no lightness, no trifling, should be indulged in. No low witticism should escape our lips, for these things give Satan great advantage. And we are living in the solemn hour of the judgment when we should afflict our souls, confess our errors, repent of our sins, and pray for one another that we may be healed. Brothers and sisters, we see. Our minds should be on preparing to see Jesus in peace. No lightness, no trifling uh, should be indulged in. No low witticism, no dirty jokes, no, no nothing that takes the mind from being connected to heaven and pulls it down low. No, brothers and sisters. No low witticism should escape our lips for these things give Satan great advantage. We're already at a disadvantage. Do we want to give Satan an even greater advantage by participating in things that disconnect us from him? Does that mean we shouldn't have a good time? No, that's not what that's saying. Does that mean we shouldn't laugh and, 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 and have joy in our hearts? Not at all. But brothers and sisters, many of God's people are caught up into entertainment. They're caught up into what's happening and they think they need to do what the world is doing. No, 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 brothers and sisters. Our minds should be connected to heaven. We need to be preparing for what we know is coming. Let's continue on. Brothers and sisters, as we get ready to close, we know that Jesus is getting ready to come. Brothers and sisters, we cannot afford to waste any more time. We're going to read one other quote to you here um, in just a moment. But brothers and sisters, we cannot afford to make light, to squander the opportunity of preparation that we have. We look around, we see the signs of the times telling us, listen, this is it. And I want to tell you, even if you could not delineate every prophecy and know the different dates and times and what 2020 means and what 2021 is looking like and what's happening in 2030 and all of these things that the scientists are talking about. And, the, and even if you couldn't look at what has happened and know for sure that all that it means, you and I still know enough to get ready. We know that we're at the end. And if we were not squandering the opportunity to prepare to afflict our souls, we would still be prepared. I'm gonna read something to you out of um, Christ in his sanctuary, um, page 188. It says, solemn are the scenes connected with the closing work of the atonement. Momentous are the interests involved therein. The judgment is now passing in the sanctuary above. For many years, this work has been in progress. Soon, none know how soon it will pass to the cases of the living. In the awful presence of God, our lives are come up in review. At this time, above all others, it behooves every soul to heed the Savior's admonition. Watch and pray. 
for ye know not when the time is. If therefore thou shalt what? Not watch. I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Solemn other scenes connected with the closing scenes of this earth's history. We know this. We see them happening. Brothers and sisters, the twin institutions that God first instituted in the Garden of Eden are under full attack. The institution of marriage is under severe attack. Just the other day, I read a story where they're admonishing nurses in, uh, as they are going through the hospital to not uh, to change their language when it comes to a mother who is feeding her child through breast milk and not they're saying not to use that, but to use a different term called chest milk, because we have uh, individuals who are transgendered, who are coming, who are trying to bear children. The institution that God instituted in the Garden of Eden is under attack, brothers and sisters, and the institution of the Sabbath is also under attack. These two institutions, when they fully crumble, brothers and sisters, Jesus is getting ready to come. Prepare, prepare, prepare. It is time to afflict our souls. When we afflict our souls, when we do what God has asked us, when we confess and truly repent, here's what God is going to do for us. One last text. Let's turn over to Zechariah chapter 3. Zechariah chapter 3. Zechariah chapter 3. And we're going to read a few verses here because this is what's going to happen when we afflict our souls. God's word says, Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1. It says, And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Verse 3. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. Verse 4. Verse 4 says, And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. And I said, Let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments, and the angel of the Lord stood by. And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts. If thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt also keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. What is God saying? If we walk in his ways, if we, if we keep his charge, he will do for Joshua what he did for us. He will take off the filthy garments and put on us clean, righteous garments. Brothers and sisters, this is what we must have if we want to be saved, if we want to see Jesus in peace. I want to encourage you today. Do not squander the opportunity of preparation that we now have. All of the things that God has asked us, we need to be trying to accomplish. Getting the victory over sin moving out of the city. Our diets need to come under his control. The list goes on. Our faith needs to grow. If we have faith, it will cause us to obey. If we obey, we will be safe to save. All of this can be done with the help of Jesus Christ. Let him into your hearts today. This is our prayer. Brothers and sisters, let's get ready, get ready, get ready. Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for allowing us to see this day. 
Lord, going through your word, talking about afflicting our souls, it is clear, Lord, that afflicting our souls is about repentance. It's about confession. It's about turning away. It's about victory. Lord, we can do none of this without thee. Continue to be with us, Lord. May that conviction that is on our hearts and in our minds stay with us. May we recommit ourselves to follow you and to be obedient, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.